Well, today is uh, Saturday, and it's the day of our, our Lady, dedicated to the Lady. So, uh, before the opening prayer, let's say a Hail Mary to as a family, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Almighty and all-loving God, in the beginning you created them, male and female, as a sign of the covenant with your people, the covenant with which you will later seal the most precious blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sublime gift that is the life-giving one flesh, union of husband and wife, and we ask you for the grace always to cherish, revere, and foster it as you intended, the foundational good of human society and the icon of the union between Christ and his church. As we celebrate these 50 years of the encyclical Humanae Vitae's articulation of the church's timeless teaching, help us to be wise, bold, and charitable messengers of this good news, so that a culture of love, life, and marriage may flourish in our land. Open the minds and hearts of those far away from this truth. Heal those harmed by its rejection and strengthen those committed to living it out and inspire others to do the same. By means of this grace, grant us peace with one another and happiness with you now in this life and to know its perfect fulfillment forever in the life that is to come. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, Head of the Bridegroom of the Church, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, St. John Paul II, Amen. Blessed Paul VI, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father um, just gave us a retreat on Wednesday, the second we've had in a row each year. And so we have this little card for you. It's for you. It's nothing really. It's just a spiritual bouquet. Okay. Thank you so much. Actually, I shouldn't say it that way, should I? I mean, there's no money in there. It's okay. Prayers. I need prayers. Yeah. Thank will, you for all you I will do. be praying for you. Uh, I have to, some nuns waiting for me for confession. So pray for me too. Thank you, God Father. Okay, so I'm not going to take a lot of time on preliminaries, or we all know why we're here. I'm going to do as a quick job on what's in your pamphlet, and then uh, introduce Bishop Lavore. I have the great privilege of doing that. If you would just take a quick look at what we're up to this morning. It's on the right-hand side of the what you'll find in your folder. On the left-hand side are some, is some information about the Siena Symposium, including a prayer to St. Catherine uh, that we in the Siena Symposium and related organizations, which include the Argument Club and now an advisory committee to us, uh, are, are praying on a regular basis. But this morning, we're going to start off with a keynote address with Bishop Lavore, and I'll say more about him in a second, and then Dr. Ann Maloney will join us at the podium to give her presentation, her talk on the teaching of Humani Vitae. Then we'll take a quick break, and at that point we'll break up into small groups. I'll probably be asking you to turn your chairs a bit, and um, we'll have a chance to look at some of the passages from the document itself. That's why we call this a workshop. You're going to have to do some work. So we have a pretty packed day, um, and I'll be keeping track of the time and helping us move along as we go through it, okay? Um, the bathrooms, the restrooms are right down the hall on the left, and I think that's it for now, okay. So with that, I would also turn your attention to the back sheet of the program, and you'll see the bios. And I'm not going to read what is there about Bishop Lavore. Um, you can read that for yourselves. But just to point out that he is the Bishop of New Ulm and traveled yesterday just for this event uh, to, to share his insights into this document. And you'll see there that he wrote this book. I'm just going to borrow that. Okay. Cover. 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 Cover
Covenant of Love, it's called. And he wrote it with Father, uh, Father Hogan. And uh, I'll tell you just briefly, uh, Bishop Lavor, then Father Lavor, did our marriage preparation. I'm pr I'm very, I always brag about that. <laughs> and Andrew and I have been married almost 30 years. And I, I, I'll never forget the marriage preparation that we went through with now Bishop Lavor. It was the beginning of everything for me. Because in that conversation, he helped me to see, and Andrew to see too, what the role of women could be in the family. He said there, I won't, can't go through the whole story, but he said the woman's job is to uh, main, keep an eye on the life of the family, right? Keep an eye on the life of the family. She sees the bigger picture, he said. And I went, wow, I wasn't expecting you to say that, and I know Andrew wasn't either. <laughs> So um, at, the, at the end of that process, I said to, to Father Lavore, I feel like I don't know very much about my faith, and I'd really like to know more. At the time, I was working at Honeywell. So he said to me, well, here's a book you could read, Covenant of Love. And this was in 1989, and he told me last night at dinner that when he and Father Hogan were in the seminary and they started to be introduced to the theology of the body. They looked around for secondary resources and there weren't any, so they wrote one. So Bishop Lavore has known for all this time about the importance of the teaching in Humani Vitae. It has shown up in his pastoral practice and in, in, in every a aspect of his life, I'm sure. So he has a lot to tell us about this document and about what led to it and what has happened since. So with that, I turn the podium over to Bishop Lavore. Thanks, Dr. Savage, and it's a real privilege for me to uh, be here and uh, to talk about uh, an issue that uh, has been so uh, contentious uh, over the years, and uh, it really, uh, the church's teaching is so, so very beautiful, and uh, I think uh, the church's teaching on marriage and family life and sexuality has, has gotten a pretty bad, uh, pretty bad publicity over the years, and so today what I hope to do is to uh, open up some of the beauty of uh, the document uh, Humani Vitae. Uh, so I'll start out uh, by uh, talking about uh, a little history that uh, I went through. Uh, I graduated here from St. Thomas uh, in 1968, and of course that's when the encyclical was issued. And as you might imagine, there was a lot of debate and so forth uh, before Paul VI issued Humani Vitae. So I'll go through some of that history, what the culture was like at the time, uh, what the response was uh, to Humani Vitae, uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, the document itself, uh, and then um, John Paul II's development of uh, Humani Vitae, because Humani Vitae, as you know, is not very long. It's a short document, and Paul VI didn't uh, intend to cover everything that there was to cover. Uh, the document was issued after uh, Vatican II, and Vatican II had, had written about marriage and family life and sexuality. Uh, and uh, so Paul VI was just writing about uh, human life, the transmission of human life, and uh, wasn't meant to be that long of, a, of an exposition. But since then, John Paul uh, has... Um, uh, elaborated on Humani Vitae and uh, deepened our understanding of it and uh, made it, uh, I think, relevant uh, for our own age. So I hope to go through some of that and uh, talk about how John Paul has done that. As you get old, your nose starts running. <laughs> I have mixed a mixed reaction to getting old one is, uh, the older I get, the closer to retirement I get. 
it's no fun being a bishop these days. So uh, I'm looking forward to re retirement. But on the other hand, I don't want to get old. So <laughs> it's a catch-22. But a little bit about the culture at the time of the issuance of Humani Vitae. Um, you know, it was a it was an extraordinary, unusual time. Uh, you've heard people probably talk about the '60s and how crazy they were. Uh, there, were there was a time that everything was be, being thrown out and thrown over. Uh, it was the day of um, protests, of uh, bra burning, of drugs, of free love, uh, all of those kinds of things and more were just part of those crazy rebellious years. And I remember Cardinal Dolan talking about the 60s and he called them the silly 60s. Uh, and they, they really were. Uh, so it was a time where everything was being challenged, uh, everything was uh, up for debate, and usually the debate led to the overthrow of, uh, of the, the, uh, the reigning culture. So when I was here at St. Thomas, you know, we knew that was the, the Second Vatican Council had ended in 1965, and uh, we knew that uh, Paul VI had uh, established a commission. Uh, Archbishop Binns, who was Archbishop here in St. Paul, Minneapolis, was on that commission. And it was called the Birth Control Commission, and uh, their task was to study, you know, study the issue, and then recommend something to the Holy Father. Well, as I'm sure you know, they did their work, and uh, they recommended to the Holy Father, we know now, uh, that uh, uh, the pill could be used, the birth control pill could be used. So um, Paul VI then was left with uh, a dilemma, you know, what should he do? Uh, there were strong voices on both sides, and uh, I'm sure it was uh, the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit guides the church. Uh, there's been a lot of, you know, turmoil even in our own day, and a lot of dissension, and uh, all of the abuse issues, and everything else that's happened in the church. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is there, and uh, he guides us. He's still with us, despite our human sinfulness. So, you know, I'm sure he was with uh, Paul VI. You know, Paul VI was a holy man. Uh, he's going to be canonized now very shortly this fall. Uh, so it'll be St. Paul VI. But uh, he, as part of that, that commission I talked about, the Birth Control Commission, one of the members was uh, Karl Wojtyla from uh, Krakow in Poland, and uh, he had, I think, you know, at the time the communists were very strong in Poland, the government was very strong, and they wouldn't even let uh, Karl Wojtyla come to meet in Rome uh, and sit on that commission. But, you know, you can't stop writing, and so he wrote, and uh, I think had, uh, as far as I understand, a great influence on, on Paul VI, and you can see a little bit of that uh, in Humani Vitae. You know, John Paul II was a, a master on, on marriage and on family life and on sexuality. Uh, he had been, you know, a college professor. He had been a parish priest. Uh, he had study groups, you know, marriage, uh, uh, married people study groups. He prepared people for marriage. Uh, he learned, you know, from the people about marriage and family life and sexuality, uh, and he was a son of the church, uh, and you know, very steeped in philosophy and theology. Had a doctorate in philosophy, a doctorate in theology. Uh, so, uh, someone who had great insight into marriage and family life, and uh, had an influence on on Paul the Sixth and on the issuance of Humani Vitae. Um, I remember, you know, again, because it was such a tumultuous time, uh, we had a bishop here, Bishop James Shannon, and he was president of St. Thomas when I was, was here, and uh, looked up to by so many. And uh, when he, might, he thought that the church was going to 
reverse itself on, on uh, his teaching on birth control. And uh, when it didn't, it just kind of threw him into a tizzy. And uh, eventually he, he left, and it was a great scandal. And, you know, many priests left uh, the priesthood here in the archdiocese uh, because of, because of uh, Bishop Shannon. So uh, we experienced, you know, the effects of uh, the culture and the issuance of Humani Vitae uh, in the archdiocese here very strongly. And uh, it was very, very disappointing and very, you know, very difficult times. But uh, as I mentioned, many people thought that uh, the pill was going to revolutionize marriage and family life. That uh, if uh, people could, uh, and they were talking about married couples, uh, if married couples could uh, use the, the pill, uh, modern technology, you know, science had made so many advances. Uh, you know, the Russians had launched Sputnik in 1958, and our country was trying to catch up. And President Kennedy said that we'll have a man on the moon by uh, before the decade was over, and we did. And, uh, you know, science and technology ruled the day, as it does, you know, much of our day and age. Um, so when uh, pharmaceutical companies came up with the pill and uh, said that, you know, people can have sexual intercourse without worrying about uh, conception. You know, well, this was uh, an advance. I mean, this was modern technology working uh, to help our life, lives to be easier, more joyful. Uh, and the promise was is that it would make a uh, married couple's relationship more loving. You know, if they could have uh, sexual intercourse without worrying about children, then uh, their love would grow, uh, their union would become stronger, and wouldn't this be good for marriages and, uh, and for families? And that's, you know, that's the argument we heard uh, over and over again. And uh, so when Humani Vitae was, uh, was issued and Paul VI said that there's an inseparable connection between the unitive and procreative aspects of sexual intercourse, and uh, that there has to be uh, an openness to life when there's sexual intercourse. Uh, again, people just shook their heads. And from the clergy to the laity, you know, nobody, uh, you know, nobody was ready for this. And um, Dr. Savage and I were talking last night, and um, there was something amiss in the church. Uh, even, you know, back before the 50s, you know, everybody looks at the 50s as uh, an idyllic time. And, oh, couldn't we go back to the 50s? You know, I lived through the 50s. I don't want to go back there, you know. Uh, something was wrong. You know, there were a lot of religious. There were a lot of priests. Things seemed to be orderly. Um, Eisenhower was president. And everything just seemed to be in the right place, and, uh, but deep down there had to be something wrong and uh, because we weren't ready for the modern world. Uh, we weren't ready for these arguments and we weren't ready uh, to stand up for our faith. Uh, so uh, the, the issuance of Humani Vitae was kind of an occasion for that to, to blossom forth and um, then everything, you know, there was so many things in the church that just fell apart. Uh, priests and religious left in droves, and uh, there was so much dissent, and the laity, you know, just uh, went the wrong direction. And, you know, that's why, you know, uh, uh, John the Twenty Third, he saw, he had to see this, you know, he had to see that there was a problem. And that something needed to be done, and that's why he called uh, the Second Vatican Council. So I don't think we figured out what exactly was wrong in those days. You know, it takes a long time to look back in history and to analyze situations and to see what the heck was going on at the time. Um, but there was something deeply wrong uh, with the faith and how it was presented. And Vatican II is the answer. It's the solution. 
Uh, Humani Vitae is the answer. It's the solution. But we're not even ready for the solution yet uh, because we don't know the problem. Uh, so uh, I think we're still grappling with all of that. And, uh, but anyway, it was, it was the day of, of technology, and uh, the church was just not prepared uh, to promote and to teach Humani Vitae. Uh, when I, um, de uh, Dr. Savage uh, mentioned that um, uh, I was in the seminary and, uh, in the 70s, and uh, I was in the seminary, St. Paul Seminary here with, with Father Hogan, and, you know, I had met him, we were good friends, uh, and so as we were going to the seminary, um, we asked ourselves, you know, how are we going to teach about marriage and family life. You know, Humani Vitae was so brief. And, you know, you, you could talk about it a little bit. You know, Paul VI talks about uh, what marriage is, you know, that it's total, that it's, it's faithful, that it's open to life. Um, you know, some beautiful paragraphs on that. But he ends by saying, you know, people do work on this, you know, theologians and physicians and scholars and laity and priests, you know, do some work on this. This is not done yet, you know. This is not the definitive uh, explanation of the church's teaching. Do some more work on this. Uh, but at, you know, the time I was in the seminary from 77 to, to 81, nobody was doing anything about Humani Vitae. And so Father Hogan and I asked ourselves, well, what are we going to say? How are we going to present this to couples? Uh, because again, uh, we've been, we're, we heard from our priest friends that when you start to talk about birth control and marriage preparation, people just turn you off. And, uh, or they holler at you. You know, I thought, well, that's the last thing I need is people hollering at me. <laughs> and so we talked about it. And we weren't sure what to do. And we weren't, you know, getting anything from the seminary. In my day in the seminary, uh, totally different today from the way it was uh, when I was in the seminary. And you probably heard stories, and I could tell you stories that would raise the hair on your head, but I won't go into those things. Uh, but uh, I remember our moral theologian that we had uh, at the seminary, he was a visiting professor of moral theology, Somebody asked him about Humani Vitae, and he said, you know what I do with Humani Vitae? I just don't talk about it in marriage preparation. And I thought, well, that's a great answer, you know. <laughs> that, that gives us a lot of help, you know. Uh, fortunately, there were, you know, a good professor or two, and, uh, like Father Dosh, Mark Dosh, who uh, died just recently. Uh, Jack Quinnell uh, was there when I was there, and so uh, they helped us, but... Um, all of a sudden, you know, in 1978, uh, there was this guy from Poland who was elected Holy Father. And it just caught the world by total surprise. They weren't prepared for this at all. And I remember watching the newscasts and, uh, you know, they had their lists of papabili and, you know, this guy from South America, this black guy. Or the, I mean, they had lists. But when Carl Wojtyla was, uh, it was announced that he was, you know, elected Holy Father, everybody went, huh? Who's this guy? You know? But, you know, he, he was well known in uh, scholarly circles and in church circles throughout the world. I mean, he had visited the United States. Uh, he had given some major addresses here in the United States. He was part of the Second Vatican Council. You know, he had met. Uh, a lot of the, the bishops, and um, so uh, they knew him, and they knew his background, and they, they knew that this is what the church needed at the time. So uh, a little ways into the papacy, you know, he was elected in 78, um, he started talking about these, this uh, marriage and family and sexuality and this theology of the body. And so Father Hogan and I, you know, we said, what is this theology of the body? We never heard of this. And nobody ever, pardon? You guys went to Italy, right? And saw the 
Uh, it was it was a little bit uh, after after we wrote this book, then we went to see John Paul II, but uh, we didn't know what you know what this was about. So we started reading the addresses, uh, and uh, you know he give uh, an address uh, at a Wednesday audience, and the Wednesday audiences, of course, were a week apart. So it was like uh, reading a serial. You know, you, <laughs> you can hardly wait till the next one comes out, you know. Then he'd end and you'd say, shoot, I wanted to know what, what comes next. Uh, so we waited, you know, week after week after week. And our uh, Father Hogan's theory and mine uh, was that John Paul had a, a book written already. And he just used the forum of the Wednesday audiences to, uh, to pub publicize that book. Because as you know now, we know what the theology of the body is, and uh, it's a pretty hefty volume. Uh, but uh, so we had read these things, and at first we thought, this guy's a little crazy, you know. This stuff, you know, I'm not sure about this stuff, if it's orthodox or not, you know. And, uh, but after we read more and more, we thought, this guy's got the answer. You know, this is, this is what we need. This is what the way we teach marriage preparation. And so uh, it gave us that, uh, that boost that we needed. Uh, and Father Hogan, you know, he, he saw this before I did. Uh, he was uh, um, really a brilliant uh, historian, but also a very fine theologian. Uh, and uh, he could put things together. He could analyze things. Uh, and then say them in a way that was was very effective, uh, both in writing and in speaking. So he was able to synthesize these Theology of the Body addresses, and he wrote a, an article for Fidelity magazine that doesn't exist anymore, but it was on the Theology of the Body, the first 63 addresses uh, of the Theology of the Body, and uh, it was beautifully done, really... Um, revolutionary in what had been done on the teaching of marriage and family life. Uh, and uh, so we were, you know, I helped him with that article. We talked about things. I had, I had studied phenomenology at the University of Dallas, so uh, that was what uh, the philosophy uh, that John Paul II had done his majority, the majority of his philosophical work in. Uh, so I had that piece of things. Father Hogan had to, you know, could synthesize. He was a theologian. And so uh, we talked about all of these things. And uh, then we were looking, you know, as Dr. Sabia said, we were looking for somebody who explained this theology of the body to us. Uh, and not the theology of the body, but someone who would write, you know, a, a textbook or, you know, something people could use. Uh, and nobody had... You know, done that. We, there were a couple attempts, and we read the read the attempts, and we said, "This is they don't have it. You know, they don't, they don't get it." So he said, "Well, let's do our own our own book." And so uh, that's what we ended up doing, and that's what uh, ended up to be uh, Covenant of Love, really God's God's work. I mean, you know, Father Hogan and I worked together, but uh, it was God's work uh, that that he did this. So. Um, we decided to go to present this to the Holy Father, to Paul, uh, John Paul II, and uh, we were able to get a front row at the Wednesday audience, and um, we gave him a copy of the book. Uh, and it, he asked an interesting question. He said, where are you studying? You know, and he didn't just ask questions to ask questions. Uh, so we thought, you know, why did he ask us that? And we came up with the conclusion that nobody was doing anything on this. And he wanted to know where we got it. You know, how did we, how did we write this thing? You know, nobody's doing anything on this. Uh, where did you guys get it, you know? And so he said, well, Holy Father, we're, we're parish priests. Ah, he said, parish priests, you know. He just loved parish life. I mean, he would have been happy to be a parish priest for the rest of his life. Uh, so he thanked us very much uh, for writing, uh, writing the book, and uh, uh, we were just, you know, thrilled, you know, at that meeting. Uh, but, you know, John Paul, in 
the theology of the body and uh, in uh, the uh, Familiaris Consortio, the apostolic exhortation on the family that he, he wrote in 1981. You know, those were really significant developments on Humani Vitae. And uh, when I started, you know, when he and I started marriage preparation, you know, we used those, those documents. And, you know, um, the, the response that we got from people was, yeah, that makes sense. You know, we, we almost fell over because, again, you know, we were expecting uh, rebellion. We were expecting people to say, you know, you're nuts, you're, you're crazy. Uh, but Dr. Savage and, and her hus husband, Andrew, um, you know, we were, <laughs> we didn't know, you know, if we were, how we were, if this was going to be eff effectively presented or anything. And we, we did our marriage preparation with couples and, and they liked it. You know, as, as Dr. Savage said, she, um, you know, got her start on John Paul from, you know, from talking, from uh, us meeting together and talking about uh, John Paul II. So, uh, yeah, the, it's, a, it's just exactly what Paul VI wanted. He wanted this development uh, of what he had written in, in Humani Vitae, and John Paul II was the answer. And that's why, you know, many times John Paul II is called uh, the Pope of the family, because, uh, because he is. I mean, he, that, that was one of the major cornerstones of his papacy. Well, how did, you know, what is, you know, how did he develop uh, Humani Vitae? Uh, and what I, what I want to do is give just a couple of examples of how that development took place. Uh, first of all, let me state that he affirmed uh, Humani Vitae. Uh, he didn't uh, say that it was wrong or it went in the wrong direction, uh, that it was, you know, uh, wrongly reasoned and all of that. None of that. None of that. He affirmed uh, Humani Vitae, but uh, again expanded on it and deepened deepened the teaching of the church uh, and made it understandable, you know, as uh, that the philosophy that he studied, uh, phenomenology, uh, is an examination of reality. It's, it's an examination of what is, you know, what exists, uh, and looking at reality from different angles, different perspectives. Uh, people say about John Paul II that, uh, you know, it, his writings never end. I mean, they keep going around and around, and they, they never end, and he's difficult to understand and difficult to read. But the lens that you have to use in reading John Paul is, is phenomenology. You realize that he's looking at reality from different points of view. Uh, so when he writes about marriage and family life, he'll look at uh, marriage, family life, and sexuality from the point of view of the wife. Then he'll write some more, and all of a sudden you see he's talking about marriage, family, and sexuality from the point of view of the husband. And then he writes a little bit more, and you see that now he's talking about from the point of view of children, uh, now society. So he says some of the same things, you know, over, but it's from a different perspective. It's from a different point of view. It's look like looking at a diamond. You know, you look at a diamond and... Uh, you can look at it from a lot of different angles, and, it, and each angle has its glitter, uh, its brightness, uh, its beauty. And that's, that's the way John Paul II does his, uh, his philosophy, and that's, that's the way he writes. Um, so you look at you know, some of the things in uh, Humani Vitae, for example. Um, uh, Paul VI uh, just starts uh, with marriage and family life. Uh, and starts talking about what marriage is. Uh, John Paul, uh, I, I'm sure, looked at that and said, well, we got to start one step back and, you know, start with, with God. Uh, and he starts with God because that's the way to do theology to, to begin with. Uh, but also uh, the insight that he had and that he uses a lot in, in various uh, various documents is that uh, human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. So the more that we know about God, the more we know about ourselves because we're created 
in his image and likeness. Uh, so John Paul starts with God and ca calls God uh, a personal, loving communion. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful way of uh, talking about the Trinity, three persons and one God, that God is a personal, loving communion. Uh, and uh, as images of God, we're called to reflect uh, the personal loving communion that is God, really in, in everything. Um, and it, it's difficult sometimes for people to talk about the Trinity, to study about the Trinity. You know, St. Augustine wrote a huge book on the Trinity, and he still didn't cover all the territory. Uh, there's just so much that can be said. But that, that, that little phrase, that little definition of the Trinity as a personal loving communion uh, is so key because, again, as images of God, we're called to reflect or image God. Uh, and we form personal loving communions. There are many personal loving communions that we're called to form. And uh, the family is one. That the husband and wife love each other. Uh, they're persons. You know, God is personal, and man and woman are created in the image of God, so they're persons. Uh, they have the ability to think and to love and to act, you know, just like God. We have those, those uh, qualities, attributes. Uh, so they're meant uh, to love each other and form a communion, a communion based on their love, a union, a family unit, you know, based on their love. And then when a little one comes, the little one is invited into this personal loving communion, becomes part of the family unit. So the family is really a, a reflection of God. It's not something that you created or I created or somebody thought would be a good idea. Uh, it comes from God, and it comes from the very nature of God and who God is. Uh, so that's where John Paul starts. And um, in Humani Vitae, uh, you know, Paul VI talks about uh, the inseparable uh, link between unitive and procreative. Um, and, you know, it, when you present that to people, it doesn't, quite, it doesn't quite hit them. You know, it doesn't quite click. So you got to say, well, how can we say that uh, in a language that people will understand and that they'll accept and that they'll live? Uh, so that, that language of personal love and communion uh, is, is really the key to understanding that uh, the procreative and the unitive are inseparable because they're part of the love that a husband and wife show to one another. Uh, and so the love, then, that they have for one another has a, a couple of aspects. It has the unitive, which is unites the couple, and the procreative, which is open to life. And both of those things uh, image or reflect God. Uh, the unitive, you know, get God is one. God is a unity. Uh, and so love is unitive. Love brings together. It doesn't drive apart. You know, sin is what drives apart. Sin is what divides. And we see so much of that today. Love brings together in, in a unity. So it does that in God, and it should also be reflected uh, by couples uh, in the act of sexual intercourse, which is what? The act of love. Uh, and then God is life. God is being. God is existence. And whenever God loves, there's life. You know, he loved us into existence. We wouldn't be here if God didn't love us into being, love us into existence. Uh, so, life is an aspect of love. Love is always life-giving. So, if you look at, uh, you know, Paul VI and the way he expressed things, um, you, you can develop that and talk about marital love and how it should reflect God and how it should have these, these two aspects because God has them and has his images and reflections we should do the same thing. We're called to imitate God, and uh, that's how we're created. And to imitate God means to, to love 
in a unitive and procreative way. Uh, so uh, let me just quote a little section uh, of uh, Familiaris Consortio, the, the document, the Apostolic Exhortation on the Family, uh, to give you an idea of how uh, John Paul II does this. And hopefully you can see that it's, it's a development of Humani Vitae. And uh, one of the things, you know, about Humani Vitae, the, the Paul VI, and rightly so, um, talks about natural law, but and, and natural law is valid. Uh, it's a, certainly a legitimate way of looking at uh, reality. It is a good explanation of reality. There's nothing wrong with it at all, except that people don't know what the heck you're talking about when you talk about natural law. Um, back when, for example, uh, Clarence Thomas was nominated for the Supreme Court, uh, he, he said, you know, that he he's, was for the Constitution and, um, you know, legitimately interpreting the Constitution in that he believed, you know, he, 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 uh, his foundation was natural law. And people didn't, I mean, the media went nuts, you know, that natural law, what's that, you know? In the scientific age, you know, we can change things, you know, we, we're, we experiment with things, we, we bend things in order to create, you know, other things. And so it just doesn't hit the, the modern mind. Um, so those things are, are very valuable and should be running in the background of anybody who's talking about these issues, but it's not the first thing that you, that you present. So here's, you know, here's the way John Paul would uh, talk about um, uh, sexuality. Uh, he says the, uh, he talks about how, um, I got the wrong section here. Um, here we go. Uh, he talks about um, how um, uh, sexuality isn't something purely biological. You know, sometimes you'll hear an argument, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later on, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, Paul VI's teaching on sexuality submits us to biology. You know, we're above that. We're not, you know, governed by our biology, but rather we govern biology. And uh, so that was one of the arguments against Humani Vitae. But John Paul, um, you know, talks very beautifully uh, in his own language, developing Humani Vitae and giving us a, a language that we can use to talk about sexuality. Uh, he says sexuality... And he, he calls it the means by which a man and a woman give themselves to one another. And that's just another way of saying love one another. So sexuality is the way that a husband and wife give themselves to one another. Uh, it's part of what Paul VI calls a totality. Uh, so the whole person, uh, male person, female person, uh, in the act of sexual intercourse, the whole person should be given to the other through sexual intercourse, uh, and the other person should be received totally. So there's a total giving and receiving. So sexuality is the means by which that happens. You know, on their marriage day, a husband and wife promise to be one. You know, the two will love each other to such a great extent that the two become one, and that's scriptural. Um, and through it, sexual intercourse, that unity is manifested. So he says sexuality is the means by which a man and a woman give themselves to one another through the acts which are proper and exclusive to spouses. Uh, so that's the act of sexual intercourse, that, that act is proper and exclusive to spouses, not just anybody, uh, but to spouses. He says sexuality is no, by no means something purely biological, all right? So it is biological as human persons uh, created in the image of God. Uh, we have a body, uh, and that's the whole point of the theology of the body. Uh, our body is biological, uh, but we also have a, a soul, an immortal soul, 
uh, which has the attributes of thinking or reasoning and loving. And the body and soul in the human person go together to form the whole living human person. So the body just isn't some biology that uh, we just happen to have, but rather uh, the body is part of who we are as persons. That's one of the main points of the theology of the body. The body is part of who we are. Uh, and John Paul says when we touch the body, we touch the person. Okay? So the body just isn't biology, but rather is a constituent of the person. So it's by no means something purely biological, but sexuality uh, concerns the innermost being of the human person as such. Uh, in other words, it's a way that a husband and wife communicate the deepest part of who they are to one another. Uh, it's the way they give themselves to one another and receive the other into their life. Uh, and it brings about that unity. And it's an expression of unity, and it brings about unity. Okay? Deb's given me that. What is it? I can't read it. I'm, I, I'm getting old. I'm half blind. So it's five minutes. So okay. All right. Uh, so uh, it's the way that that totality is uh, brought about. And that's, you know, that's the unitive aspect uh, that uh, uh, Paul VI talks about. But you see how, how beautifully uh, John Paul develops that and, and talks about it. Uh, that it's the way that a husband and wife communicate the most uh, sacred part of their being uh, to one another. Okay, with, a, with a couple minutes left here. Um, he talks about, uh, you know, in, in Humani Vitae, Paul VI talks about uh, marriage as being total, faithful, and open to life. Uh, John Paul does the same thing. But it's, it's a little different kind of language, a little different pre uh, presentation. Uh, he's talking about the, the, the uh, content of participation in the life of Christ. In other words, when a couple gets married, uh, Christ's life is there for them to live out their married love. Uh, so he's talking about this participation in Christ's life. And he says, the content of participation in Christ's life is also specific. Conjugal love or marital love involves a totality uh, in which all of the elements of the person enter. And in case you don't know what the elements are, he lists them. Appeal of the body and instinct, power of feeling and affectivity, aspiration of the spirit or soul and the will. So, you know, he's, whereas Paul VI is very brief in, in stating the, this totality, John, the Paul, John Paul II elaborates, tells us what's involved, that it's both the soul and the body. It's a total self-gift of husband to wife. So it aims at a deeply personal unity, the unity that beyond union in one flesh or body leads to forming one heart and one soul. And it demands those three things that Paul VI talked about. It demands indissolubility, uh, in other words, totality, faithfulness in definitive mutual giving, and it's open to fertility. It's open to life. So again, that aspect of love. When God loves, it's always life-giving. And when husband and wife love uh, through the act of sexual intercourse, uh, it is open to life. One final thing, though. I'm going to end with uh, a little quote on... Uh, the way John Paul talks about uh, contraception, uh, and uh, of course this was the, you know, the what people criticize so much about uh, about humani vitae. Uh, he talks about uh, in sexual intercourse the body uh, speaking a language, okay, the language of the body, and that language is a language of total self-giving. That's what it speaks. So just as our body expresses what's inside of us through speech, so does the body by what we do speak. It speaks a language. And in sexual intercourse, the language is supposed to be love. So he says the, the innate language 
that expresses the total reciprocal or mutual self-giving of husband and wife is overlaid through contraception by an objectively contradictory language, namely that of not giving oneself totally to the other. That's, that's absolutely critical. Uh, this language of the body and that is expressed in sexual intercourse uh, is one of total, complete self-giving, body and soul, everything. Contraception overlays that language of totali tota totality or, or total gift with a contradictory language. In other words, language says, that says, I'm not giving myself totally to you. I'm not going to act as an image of God. I'm not going to have this act of intercourse be open to life. Um, so when a woman gives herself to her husband, uh, gives everything, including her fertility, the way it is at the time, the man, when he gives himself to his wife, gives everything, including the body. It's part of the person. It gives everything. Both should be giving everything. And to withhold something uh, is to say, I love you, but not quite. And that's a very subtle way in which contraception erodes marital love. And it's not something that is easily seen. If it were easily seen, everyone would be practicing natural family planning. But they don't because it's not easily seen. So the devil has found a very fertile way of dividing husband and wife, of dividing families, and it's through the act of sexual intercourse that's overlaid with a contradictory language that it's not total self-giving, there's something I'm holding back. And when we hold back, what's that? That's selfishness. And when selfishness creeps into marital love, there's division. And we've seen the fruit of that. Uh, Paul VI predicted it. Marriages are not more loving. You know, the divorce rate is sky high. We've got infidelity. We've got all kinds of sexual problems and issues. Uh, and uh, things came to, seem to keep escalating and escalating. So um, Paul VI was a prophet. I mean, he saw what was coming. Uh, he wrote it so beautifully and succinctly. Uh, and the Holy Spirit called John Paul II to the papacy to develop that teaching and to give it to us today. So hopefully through this day, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, and uh, my hope is to give you uh, just a little bit of language, you know, that you can use in presenting the teaching of Humani Vitae, the language that John Paul II uses to so effectively talk about marriage, family life, and sexuality. So thank you very much. Good morning. I have the honor of introducing our next speaker. Dr. Anne Maloney received her PhD in philosophy from Marquette University in 1988. She is the chair of the department at the university, sorry, St. Catherine. She was, was chair, chair at, at the University of St. Catherine, has handed off that duty, and is now a civilian member of the department again. Okay. <laughs> One of the difficulties in academic life at present is that people get caught in what I'll call silos. Anne is not caught in silos. If you take just a brief glance, I won't read it all to you, but her areas of specialization range over ethics, philosophy of women, philosophy in literature. I hear rave reviews on her Flannery O'Connor insights, right? Existentialism. Anne does it all. One of the things that makes it an honor to introduce Anne is that, well, let me give a little bit of background. My husband will always say that one of the gifts that we had as a young married couple was friends who were just a little bit ahead of us, right? Just a little bit ahead. So they had their children maybe five or 10 years older than ours. And getting to watch people do it right, do it well. Anne and Steve have been those friends for us, among others as well. But 
it is an honor to introduce to you Dr. Ann Maloney. Thank you, Kathy, for that, really. I'm just all over clump now <laughs> uh, for that lovely introduction. And, and thank you for being here, Bishop Lavoir, and for your words of wisdom. Um, I'm, of course, not a bishop. And so um, I'm going to talk about Humanae Vitae from a different perspective as a philosopher, but also as um, someone who grew up in the Catholic Church and is still in the church, and um, as a mother and as a wife myself. Um, I was in the fourth grade in 1968 when uh, Pope Paul, Paul VI issued Humanae Vitae. I had no idea what sex was. I had never heard the word contraception. And the pill was a word that my mother used to disparage people she didn't like. <laughs> Even if someone had mentioned Pope Paul's encyclical to me in 1968, I wouldn't have had time to think about it because I was super busy being overwhelmed by the many post-Vatican II changes that had invaded my little world at Christ King School. I had just figured out what hoc est anum corpus meum meant. I was getting used to following along in my children's missile while watching Father's Back when suddenly Father started facing us during Mass and speaking in English. Our school sisters of Notre Dame started wearing short skirts and blouses and showing us their hair. Our Baltimore catechisms had disappeared overnight and been replaced by the sounds of silence and collage making materials. <laughs> so this was a lot for a fourth grader to deal with. I was supposed to find out what sex was in the sixth grade when my mother accompanied me to school one evening for a mandatory movie night. Apparently, the theme of the movie was what we used to call the facts of life, but to be honest, I had no idea what was going on in that movie. Um, I didn't know why my mother was with me at school at night, but I knew it was probably pretty important. The narrator told us in the movie that there were going to be very soon times of the month when I would not feel well, but I should go bowling with my friends nonetheless. Now, I had never been bowling in my life. We were not bowling people. So this, is, this mystified me. On our way home from the movie, my mom said, so did you understand everything in the movie? And I said, yes. <laughs> but I didn't tell her that what I understood was I needed to find some bowling friends and engage with them even if I didn't feel good. A year later, I did ask what sex was, and my mother told me. I thought it was just about the most ridiculous thing I had ever heard, and I was astonished to think that my refined and ladylike mother would ever have engaged in such an activity. Even then, contraception didn't come up. Sex was something people did to make babies, and babies were wonderful, and almost certainly worth whatever strange activities it took to produce them. The thought of not wanting babies was typically, simply too weird to imagine. So as you can tell, it was a different world. I didn't think about contraception again, really, until 1973, when the Supreme Court legislated abortion on demand in the United States. I was instantly and unselfconsciously pro-life, and so was everyone in my world. Legal abortion, though, was the reality that got me thinking in a sustained way about the fact of unplanned pregnancy. As Janet Smith once said, abortion is not the result of failed contraception. It is the result of failed relationships. And that seemed really um, profound to me. It was the fact that a pregnant woman would want to have an abortion that got me thinking about what circumstances would a woman be in where she would think that that was a good idea. I attended a Catholic high school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and there was, um, after 1973, a great deal of talk in my religion classes about sex and marriage and birth control. The Sisters of Divine Savior who taught those classes were pretty strongly convinced that doddering old Paul VI had really messed this one up. And they pointed out the many ways in which contraception, by removing the fear of pregnancy, as Father was talking about, from a married couple's lives, would clear a space for lots of loving expressions of conjugal love. This made sense to me. Of course, I was 13. Um, and I started to feel just as cross at Pope Paul as those nuns did. So I brought my arguments home to my Catholic mother. My mother did not have any good arguments for me, and I started taking some real pleasure in expo exposing the flaws in her reasoning. 
At the end of her rope after a while of this, she finally exploded. Fine, she said, you have all the answers. But I can tell you this, I have never failed to teach the trusting, t trust the teachings of the church, and the church has never let me down. I don't think I ever admitted it to my mother, but that sentence had a profound impact on my life and on me. As a practical question, contraception didn't come up for me for many more years. I grew up in the sort of family where if you called yourself Catholic, well then by gum, you were Catholic. We were not a choose your own toppings kind of Catholic family. The church's task was to discern and articulate the Holy Spirit and not lead the faithful into moral error. Our job was to listen to the church and follow her teachings. I simply expected that I would remain a virgin until I married and once married, use what my mother called rhythm and what my older sisters called natural family planning, which was a pretty new and trendy phrase back then. God in his wisdom really helped me out with that whole commitment to virginity thing by making me fat and really, really shy <laughs> for all of my high school years and most of college. <laughs> because of God's wisdom, I never even had a boyfriend, much less a potential lover. Um, but then I went to Marquette University to study for my PhD in philosophy. Uh, when I entered Marquette, Pope John Paul II was two years into his papacy, and his father pointed out, was in the uh, process of giving a whole series of homilies that later became known as the theology of the body. I did not know it then. Um, I did not know that Pope John Paul had been very influential on Paul VI when Paul VI was writing Humanae Vitae. When John Paul II became pope, I was not a pope groupie kind of girl. I was very disinterested in popes in general. Um, and I don't think I ever would have, uh, maybe not for a long time anyway, read these homilies, except I had at graduate school met, befriended, and fallen in love with a fellow graduate student who was actually planning to write his dissertation on John Paul II. He talked about him a lot, so good girlfriend that I was, I read these homilies, and you know, I was just blown away. He had arguments. I wanted arguments. Oh, he had them. Um, and they were really good arguments. Uh, and behind those arguments, I could sense a deep love for Jesus Christ and the church that Christ left to us. I've always had the feeling ever since that if I'd ever had the chance to have a cup of coffee with John Paul II, um, he'd have an argument, a beautiful argument, philosophical argument for everything the church teaches. But at the end, he'd say, you should have listened to your mother. Well, I did, so. Um, <laughs> So this fellow who was in love with John Paul II was also in love with me, which worked out well, and he asked me to marry him. I said yes. He was and is the sort of Catholic that I had been raised to be. If you're Catholic, you follow the moral wisdom of the church. I knew we would be using NFP in our marriage. I was terrified. <laughs> Neither of us had finished our PhDs when we married. We moved to St. Paul three months after our wedding because I had a one-year position at St. Kate's, and he had a temporary one-semester appointment at Gustavus Adolphus. We were broke, we were both teaching full time and finishing our dissertations. I was convinced that natural, natural family planning meant I would immediately get pregnant and proceed to have 12 children, a fate for which I knew I was ill-equipped. <laughs> Trusting the church on this teaching was the hardest and biggest act of faith I had ever made in the Catholic Church, but I did. I made, I made that act of trust, and I am very grateful that I did that. As it turned out, God agreed with me that I was not suitable for a family of 12 children <laughs> and blessed us with three. But while using NFP, I really made some intriguing discoveries. First of all, not being able to have sex whenever we wanted to have sex was sometimes very difficult, and I'm not going to gloss that over. But struggling together to honor chastity gave our relationship a level of depth and trust that I don't know where we would have developed otherwise. And while it was often a real struggle to remain chaste when we needed to, there was a flip side to that. NFP really did help to uh, sustain the romance in our relationship. When our charts gave us the green light, so to speak, it was a special and much anticipated time, which we often would celebrate by going on a date or we were still really broke staying home and having a bottle of wine and a game of Scrabble. It really did encourage us to court each other. And it also taught us that not every ex expression of affection leads or should lead to sexual intercourse. Now, sometimes people say, oh, well, that's sexist, but I'm going to say it anyway. My experience has been that men tend to express every emotion they're having by saying, let's have sex. 
I'm happy. Hey, let's have sex. I'm sad. Let's have sex. I'm needy. Let's have sex. You seem needy. Let's have sex. Um, <laughs> NFP forces husbands to find other ways to say I love you. And that's a really good thing. Also, NFP appealed to the feminist in me. Um, I had my one-year appointment at St. Kate's had morphed into a five-year appointment, but I was conscripted into teaching feminist philosophy. Um, but reading philosophic texts from feminists for the first time, I couldn't help but see connections between basic feminist principles and the church's teaching on sexuality. Learning my cycles of fertility taught me what an amazing thing a woman's body really is. When I was in graduate school and when I got married, I was still dealing with a pretty impressive eating disorder. Um, and I realize now, looking back, that my first year of marriage and my use of NFP was the beginning of my recovery from that eating disorder. Because that's what taught me how to see my body in terms of what it could do, and not just as a frame for pretty clothes and makeup. So that's kind of a long backstory, but I do like to begin a talk like this, as Father did as well, um, some sense of, as we said in the 70s, where I'm coming from. Um, I mentioned earlier that I started reading JP2's homilies when I was in graduate school. So what was in those homilies that so blew me away? Um, well, first of all, those homilies begin with Jesus talking about marriage. Hold on. Maybe I should just put this here. Well, I'm going to talk about Diet Coke later in my talk, so stay tuned. Um, <laughs> The Mosaic law allowed divorce under certain circumstances, and the Pharisees were questioning Jesus as to whether or not that was still permissible. Jesus responded that, no, divorce is no longer permissible. That's not acceptable. And, you know, the Pharisees weren't so happy to hear that because the idea was that the fall happened. Sin had obscured our ability to act in, con in a concerted way with our intellect and our will. And so we really just weren't capable of, you know, of, of, of living perfectly. But Jesus responded to the Pharisees, and he was basically reclaiming that original unity of man and woman as found in Genesis. And the point is, Jesus was more or less saying, I'm here now. Oh, sorry. I'm here now. Uh, what wasn't possible is possible again because I'm going to redeem you. So what was that original vision in Genesis that, that broke when the world broke? Well, for one thing, God made it really clear that we would never be acting in his image and likeness if we acted alone. God said it is not good for man to be alone. And then he said, let us, Father was talking about the Trinity, right? Let us make man in our image and likeness. So we know the man doesn't image God. The woman doesn't image God. The man and the woman together image God. And when God said it is not good for man to be alone, the, the Hebrew word that is used in the, in the original text is neged. An apt translation of the word neged is in your face or counterpart. So when God said it was not good for man to be alone, he meant we need to be in each other's face. We need to be the other's counterpart. It is not good for either of us to be alone. And so that word alone, which so often we tend to interpret as lonely, actually is more closely allied with the meaning of self-sufficient. We are not self-sufficient, and it is not good for us to think that we are. Also, as, um, as Father was pointing out, our embodiment is not just accidental. Our embodiment is part and parcel of who we are. To be a man or a woman is not accidental to our ultimate fate. My body is just not something I have and use. It's something I am. When I give a talk, for example, or when I teach a class, I will often gesture. I never know this until someone tells me that I'm doing it. Um, but it's not like I'm giving my talk and then I think, good time for a gesture. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just gesturing while I talk. And I can't say, this is my body or this is my soul. This is me. When my kids used to cry out in the night, um, I would be halfway across the bedroom floor before my brain had even really registered that I was moving toward them. It wasn't my body. It wasn't my soul. It was me. We love, and we love in and through our bodies. Our bodies say something very profound about who we are and how we are supposed to love. The body is so important. Um, God was not a Platonist because he's a dualist. So, but then the other thing that is so important to remember is that, yeah, we're our bodies, but our bodies are also not all that we are. We aren't angels. We aren't pure spirits, but we're also not just animals. 
And JP2 says, you know, the first human creature looked around and said, oh, okay, I'm alone. The woman appeared, but in a way, even after the woman appeared, they were both still alone because they looked out at the universe and they didn't see anything like them. Plants weren't like them. Animals weren't like them. There was something very different. Now, science is constantly trying to explain who we are by looking at animals. And there's a lot of wisdom we can get from that. Thus, the Diet Coke. I've been told many times that drinking the amount of Diet Coke that I drink will cause bladder cancer. Because when they feed that amount of Diet Coke to rats, rats get bladder cancer. So I think very hard and long about that as I drink my Diet Coke. Um, so this information can be very helpful. But we are not merely animals. Some things we do that animals don't do, well, we have free will. We worry about death. We feel pulled between good and evil. We found universities. We build cathedrals. We tell jokes and get anxious about immortality. Animals just aren't giving any signs that they're doing these things. Or if they're doing them, oh my god, they are the best stealth society ever because I can't find their cathedrals or their universities. Um, we used to have these pet guinea pigs and I'm pretty sure they spent zero hours worrying about death. One day, they were in their outdoor cage chomping away on some grass, and a couple dogs from the neighborhood got into the cage and mauled them to death. My daughter saw this and ran out to save the pigs um, and failed to do so. The pigs were killed. She was a wreck. I mean, these were her pets. We buried the pigs. We got a statue of St. Francis for the pigs. We cried tears over the pigs. We talked about whether the pigs would be in heaven because God did create animals. We, these, we had a lot of angst about the pigs. Now, if God forbid my daughter had been killed in front of the pig, the pig would have looked up and gone right back to eating his lettuce and pooping and doing what pigs do. So doing just what animals do is something we're capable of, but it does not fulfill us. It is not what we were made for. I mean, just think about sex. I mean, that's fun, right? Um, why do animals have sex? I asked this one time in class. Why do animals have sex? The first response I got from a student was to reproduce. I said, really? Do you think that animals are looking at the cute collie down the block and thinking, oh, I'd like to have a baby with that one? <laughs> if an animal has sex, and so however many months the animal gestation period is, a puppy shows up with that animal's eyes, you know, it's not like he thinks, oh, we're a family now. Um, he has no idea that the good feeling he experienced a long time ago has anything to do with the puppy who has his eyes. We also have sex. But we can do it the way animals do it, but that certainly makes us miserable. We understand that, there's an, that, we understand that sex brings babies. And we also have an intellectual and heart relationship to sex. When an animal goes into the sex act and has a good experience, that is one happy animal. In other words, physical fulfillment achieved. All, uh, I'm happy. But human beings can go into sex and have a physically fine experience and feel awful. Why? Because the physical sensations aren't really what we're going in there for. We're going in there to be loved and to love, to feel one, to be one with the other. Um, and that's why empty sex can be so devastating to the human person. So what we know, what we do with our bodies is part and parcel of what we do with ourselves, as Father said. And um, our bodies are important. We will be resurrected bodily. We are not going to be in some pure spiritual heaven. Our bodies are that important. They are how we know and love. And we often, at least I often hear people say, oh, why can't the Catholic Church get out of my bedroom? Why does the Catholic Church want to have all these ideas about sex? Why can't they just, you know, stop talking like our bodies are dirty? The church has never taught that our bodies are dirty, officially. Uh, not even close. Some father so-and-so may have somewhere down the line in 1503, but not the church. Our bodies are sacred. And one of the things I do in class sometimes to make this point is, why is rape devastating? Much more devastating than a house burglary. Because when a woman is raped, it's not something, oh, look, my housing has been damaged. No, I, I have been attacked. So when we have sex with the beloved other, we are giving ourselves the gift of ourselves. And our bodies speak who we are. We are the being made for the other. Um, let's go back to Genesis for a moment, right? So when the first creature was created, he had no idea who he was. In some very real sense, he wasn't even male at that point. 
because it was only after the creation of the woman that he looked and he said, I get who I am. I get what this is for. I'm the being that was made for her. And the woman says, I am the being that is made for you. And how we love each other is written in our bodies. Now, this was all peachy keen before the fall. Everything was beautiful. We were created to image God. We knew how to do it. And God, as you all know so well, um, gave us the whole, the whole of being and said, have at it. One thing, don't eat from that tree. What tree? Not an apple tree. There are no apples in Genesis. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Basically, God was saying, okay, so I'm God. And I see this with my kids all the time, right? They don't know why they can't do X, Y, Z. And I'll say, that's because you're a child. You don't see what this is going to do to you, but I do because I'm your parent. So just follow my lead here. I know what I'm doing. So God said, you're going to think you know better than I do what will make you flourish and what will ruin you. You don't. Do not eat from this tree. Do not decide for yourselves what will fulfill you and what will destroy you. You don't know. I do. I'm God. Trust me. So what do we do? We ignore it. And we still do every day, right? How many times in a day do we say, oh, no, I think I know better? Lucifer became Satan because of the sin of the pride, sin of pride, and we fell because of the sin of the pride. And that brokenness entered the world, and that brokenness ex, uh, was, was showed up in, in, in our lives, in, in our sexual lives. When God created us, his father said, he created us out of pure, unadulterated love. He loves us for our own sake. I don't have to do or be anything for God to love me. And, I mean, I have a friend who, when she was struggling with some things in her life, I thought her beloved spouse said the most beautiful thing a spouse can say. He said, all you have to do for me to love you is be. And, you know, that's what God says to us. And as the image of God, that's what we're called to. We are called to say to our husband, all you have to do for me to love you is be. Not because you make me feel good about myself, not because you have a good gene pool and I want to have pretty kids, just be. When we look at our children, all you have to do for me to love you is just be. Yeah, I'm going to like it if you look cute in gap overalls, and I'm probably going to feel all pride and like, why, when you get straight A's? It's like, I did something. Um, but, but you don't have to do or be any of those things for me to love you. That's what love is. When you love someone, you simply don't use them. But the fall happened, and now our broken selves, we are more than capable of using the others as objects for, for, our, own, for our own pleasure, our own use. We are capable of violating the personhood of the, of, of the other. And then when we love in this way, when we use the other person, we're not, it's not love. It's not a gift. It's an IOU. And that's why Father was indicating the church calls contraception a lie. We are saying one thing with our head, and another thing with our bodies. I'm saying, I love you completely. I love you totally. I love you utterly. Oh, except this. I want to give the part of me to you that will experience pleasure. I want that pleasure from you. But I don't want your possibilities. I don't want your fertility. I don't want to accept you the way that God made you. And Pope John Paul is especially worried about this, John Paul II, in terms of the woman. Because it is so easy for the man to objectify and, 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 use, and use the woman. Um, now, this isn't something, as Father was saying, that people really want to hear. The number one way to clear a room fast or sit alone on the bus, uh, by, just say, let me talk to you about how contraception objectifies women. Boom. Got the whole seat to yourself on the bus and the whole room to yourself. <laughs> people don't want to hear this. And, and certainly it's an article of faith in our culture that contraception has freed us from the tyranny of our biology, that it's a positive good, that it's a feminist principle, that Paul VI was just some celibate old white guy who neither liked nor understood woman. And the Catholic Church wants women trapped in the kitchen. This is such a strong belief that even at St. Kate's, which is a Catholic college, for women, the required core course in biology um, called the biology of women, the major project for the students is everybody design your own ideal form of birth control. And when I had a student one time who tried to use natural family planning, her professor said, you can't use that one. It doesn't work well enough. Um, this is the culture that we inhabit. This is the culture we live in, to which the church says, oh. 
in our gender fluid and multisexual world, we just don't want, to, don't want to say that any difference is serious or revelatory, that everything is socially constructed and malleable. And that's, that's the party line. And, and, but the church says, no, men and women are different. We're meant to be different. And the differences matter. And it was good old Paul VI and John Paul II who noticed that when we live in a culture that says that men and women are equal, that men and women are equal because we're the same, what ends up being the case is that every example of how we're the same, when you really think about it, is an example of a male model. Sometimes when I'm teaching ethics at St. Kate's, um, I will draw a stick man on the board, right? You know, because you're trying to make a point. Let's say about Kant's categorical imperative. And so I'll draw a stick man on the board, and I will say, this could be anyone. This could be any one of us. Really? Have I ever drawn stick man pregnant? Have I ever drawn stick man holding the hand of a toddler or pushing a buggy or a wheelchair? No. Our culture is built on this whole idea that a human being is an autonomous, rights-bearing individual entering into social contracts with others. Almost no one looks like that. Society is a lot less like the Shriners, where you can join and exit at your will and sort of be in relationship with other equal people. It's a lot more like a family, where we have levels of dependency and responsibility and, and hierarchy. So that when uh, feminists argue that men and women are basically the same, um, and that's why we're equal, it ends up that it never ends up being that way. I mean, I had a colleague years ago who was getting her PhD and got pregnant. And um, she asked for a one-year extension to write her dissertation because she was, you know, pregnant. And, and she was turned down by the director of the program, who was herself a woman. And she said, I cannot offer you an extra year because we don't offer the men that. See? Right? We're equal. Everybody's equal. As soon as you ignore the fact that women give birth to children and get pregnant with children and then say everything's equal, you end up being Henry Higgins, right? He's saying, why can't a woman? be more like a man, which should be like the fight song of our whole culture. <laughs> um, and you know, teaching at a woman's college for 30 years now, I can't believe I've been there that long, has been a real life lesson um, in the trenches of, of how unfeminist that idea is. Guess what? Mostly in my experience, it's not women who are out there looking for commitment-free promiscuous sex, and that's what the pill allows. No matter how much my students try, they don't like being friends with benefits. They are almost always secretly hoping that sex with this fellow will lead to friendship, love, marriage, and yes, baby someday. They're bewildered and sad when they wake up next to a stranger after a night of quote unquote fun. And it doesn't help that the fun necessitated application of various foams, wires, jellies into their bodies, or requires taking a medication that makes them bloated, cranky, and pimply. This is also that they can have the joy of heading out for a night of binge drinking as a necessary prerequisite. You want to know why female binge drinking is going up in college? I'll tell you why. Women don't want to do what they're doing. And they wake up next to someone they may or may not ever see again. They know in their deepest self that if anyone is having fun in this culture, it isn't them. Now, before the 20th century developments in contraception that gave us the pill, we had, women had a strong biological investment in sexual union. We're the ones who get pregnant. We're the ones who nurse babies. We have good reason for being interested in relationships and commitment as a necessary accompaniment to sex. The church agrees with women. Commitment to sex only within the confines of permanent relationship isn't just a biological quirk that we can get rid of once the proper barriers are in place. Women are naturally meant to be in relationship we receive the male sexually. We develop and nurture life within ourselves. We nurture that life after birth. Even if I never have children, if I'm Mother Teresa, well, I'm no Mother Teresa, but even if I'm like a celibate nun, my body says, that's who I am. Women are traditionally more intuitive, intuitive, they're more empathetic. And traditionally, women held the standard of virtue that said sex goes with marriage because sex brings babies and babies thrive in marriage. Um, now the sexual revolution tells us, no, 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 we're never going to be free until we can walk away from sex as easily as men can, instead of saying to men, hey, you know what? You shouldn't be able to walk away from sex. And you know, as Father said, Paul VI predicted a lot of this. Many of you probably know that the two most prescribed drugs in the, uh, at the University of Minnesota just down the street, most prescribed drugs are the birth control and antidepressants. 
And I'm getting really weary of hearing my students talk about how crappy they feel after sex, which is like so weird, you know, because it should just be so much fun, you know? And the saddest part is that many of them are contracepting because their mothers did the responsible thing and sent them to college with foams, jellies, wires, the whole bit. We get complaints on a regular basis at St. Kate's that unlike St. Olaf and the U of M, we don't have giant bowls of condoms in the residence halls. They get angry when they can't drop into the health center to get fitted for an IUD or prescription for the pill. And, and I wish you could see their faces when they'll come to me and complain about this. And I'll say, well, you know, the health center is for people who are ill, and fertility is not a sickness. Fertility is not a problem. Fertility is the way God made us. And when we tell an entire generation, first time ever, an entire generation of women was medicated for something that is not a disease, what message does that send? You need to be fixed. You have a problem. You need to overcome your body. For what? For nothing that you really want and for something that will probably break you. I'm always reminded of Cinderella, you know, the real gruesome, grim version, where the stepmother, notice it's a woman, says to her daughters, I don't care what you have to do to fit into this slipper. Just do it. Cut off your heels. Cut off your toes. Just do it. I love the fact that the Catholic Church says, how about if we say to the prince, you need a bigger shoe? And you know, I know I've, I've got like three minutes, but I'm going to say a few more things. This is not working out well for men either. Have any of us tuned in lately to see how it's going for young men? Men between, say, the ages of 20 and 30? How are they doing? Not so well. When women demanded a high degree of commitment and responsibility before engaging in sex, <clears throat> men tended to get married. They got jobs, real jobs, that could support a family. Living in their parents' basement while they found themselves, not really an option. Also, increasing numbers of young men are showing up at 12-step meetings, admitting an addiction to pornography. The insidious ease with which men can access pornography, coupled with a contraceptive culture that encourages men to treat women as objects for their use, has men completely in its thrall. More and more, men are finding it too hard to meet and spend time with actual human women because, you know, we have flaws and quirks and imperfections. The women they encounter in porn are always sexually alluring, always eager for them, and always interested in whatever perverse activity they've dreamt up. Now, men know in some level they're in dangerous territory. They're desperately lonely. They are crying for help. They know what utter emptiness feels like, too. So to conclude, those well-meaning sisters of divine savior at my uh, Catholic high school castigating Pope Paul for refusing to make love easier for all of us, yeah, no, you got that wrong, sisters. <laughs> when I read Humanae Vitae for the first time, I couldn't believe that, as Father, as father said, Bishop, sorry, Bishop, uh, was, was such a prophet. All the love that was going to be created in the world, really quickly, just a few statistics. 50 years ago, there were two sexually transmitted diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea. Now there are over 40. There are 3 million new cases of chlamydia every year. The rate of ectopic pregnancy has risen 600% since 1960. There are over 6 million new cases of human papillomavirus every year, a major cause of cervical cancer. In 1960, 6% of all babies in the United States were born out of wedlock. 6%. In 2018, 49% of babies born in the United States were born out of wedlock. 68% of children currently living in, or excuse me, 68% of children living with a never married parent live in poverty. 42% of children living with separated or divorced parents live in poverty. 38% of children living with cohabiting parents live in poverty. 12% of children living with married parents live in poverty. In 1960, one out of four marriages ended in divorce. The divorce rate doubled between 1960 and 1980 and now hovers at 51%. According to a study by Toronto historian Robert Michel, adultery has skyrocketed since 1960. What else happened in 1960? Gee, I don't know. Oh, yeah, the pill was invented. So what do we do? We have to begin where we are with what we have, and we have a lot. We have this wonderful teaching. It's a powerful document. We must live it by example. We are the only catechism most of the people in our lives will ever see. We have to teach our daughters to demand a world that values them as women. We have to remind ourselves and them that our bodies are a gift from God, not a grotesque accident for technology to overcome. And we have to teach the world that women are beautiful and the world needs to remake itself for that particular kind of beauty. And I do see great cause for hope in the generation coming up. My sense is that this generation 
doesn't want the teaching watered down. They don't want to sit on pillows and sing Bridge Over Troubled Water. They want to know how to live, and they want their lives to mean something. They don't care if the truth is hard. They just want their lives to mean something. But we have good news to share with them. Their lives do mean something. And we have the documents. We have the church that will help us tell them how. So we have to start living as if we knew that. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was fantastic. Wow. What a good morning so far, right? So it's time for a break, although it has to be shorter than we planned, okay? So, but I know you're ready for one. So we'll take a quick break. Let's get back at 5 after 11. Okay, so um, not all of the panelists here. Jean Stoffelstead, where are you? Are you here? She, oh, she did. Oh, okay. So good. Then the whole panel is assembled. And I think we want to start, uh, let me mention that there's two microphones over here. If you want to speak to the panel yourselves, you can do that. And I, I would ask you to use the microphone because we're recording this. And if you don't do that, they won't be able to hear your question. Okay. So I haven't looked through any of these at all. And it, unless someone else makes a move, I'll ask the first one. But um, there's another one. Oh, it looks like a long one. Okay. Okay, so um, does anyone who hasn't submitted a card want to get the ball rolling? Or should I just start with these? Go ahead, yeah. Will you please introduce the panel and tell us who all, I know. Oh, I'm Ms. sorry, sure, that's a good point. Thank Bishop you. Bishop Lavore, Miss Ellie Jensen, Dr. Catherine Deevil, and Dr. Ann Maloney. And Bishop, we know who he is. Dr. Mal uh, Maloney teaches at St. Kate's. Dr. Devold teaches at St. Thomas. And Ellie, I'm not sure where you're located, really. I'm oh, that's right. And so uh, Ellie is teaching at Hill Murray. OK. Is that what you meant? OK. Anything else? Yes. Can you go to the mic? There's one right there. Sure. Thank you. I'm, my name is Marianne. I'm looking for recommendations of things that I can read that defies, or not defies, defines what was God's intention for marriage. And I know we've got Humana Vitae, we've got um, St. John Paul's teachings, but I guess I'm looking for a nutshell that I can say, this is the goal, this is the beauty, this is exactly what God wants for you, being a young person looking to marriage someday. So I can give it to them so they can go, okay, this is what I want to strive for. Thank you. Who would like to take that first question? And by the way, there should be a resource, list of resources in your packet and there isn't because I forgot to put it in there. So we'll post it on our website. We did prepare one, and I forgot about that, OK? But maybe someone has an immediate response to that right now. Anyone? I'll give it a shot. Uh, some of them I actually heard mentioned in my small group. I would say that love and responsibility is probably for the older, the older child, maybe. <laughs> so you're a late high school or a college student. Um, but I do think that there are a number of resources that are moving from, from the, like, the two-second version to the much longer. Um, one of them, I would say, is to, to look at some of the, maybe the pro-life snippets initially and find a community and then go from there. But um, I would say that JP2's love and responsibility is great. Uh, if the person is intellectually minded, I think pretty much anything by Janet Smith is great. Uh, she's got an audio of, I think she calls it why not contraception. I always switch back and forth between why and why not. But I believe it's why not contraception. And it's for a general audience. And to be honest, I, I would say that my own experience with my children is that they are whip smart. And by the time I introduce something, they're more than ready for it. So I would think that Janet is incredibly clear, and she's a very good theologian. Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, 
I remember reading a book in college by Edward Sree. I think it's called Man, Woman, and the Mystery of Love. Pretty sure. Um, that was really impactful. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Anything by Edward Sree is really good, yeah. Let me ask a question from a card while you one guys thing? are. Can I just say oh, one thing I'm about it? No, that's okay. It just Go came ahead. to me, so I yes. went with the moment. Yes. Um, I just want to say that one of the most valuable resources you have is yourself um, because our kids look to us to see what kind of life will bring them joy. And if we're living our lives with joy and we tell them it's because we are Catholics and the Catholics gave us the rules for joy, that's really powerful. So I think that's really important to say that's a really big uh, resource as well. Thank you. No, it's okay, Anne. Thank you. You are right. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a, a frequently asked question, so it's more doctrinal, but uh, we'll go back and forth between um, more pastoral and doctrinal, I think. Um, someone argued to me that it is inconsistent to argue against homosexual marriages and for marital sex outside fertility. Uh, I imagine that must mean when a couple is infertile, etc. What is your response? So how do you make the case that uh, married couples who are happen to be infertile or are past the age of repro their reproductive years, that that kind of uh, intimacy is uh, okay and consistent with God's law and, uh, and homosexual marriages and sex in that regard or not, since they're both infertile acts? And maybe Bishop Lavoie would like to tackle that one. Jeez. If I can get the microphone. Sorry. Hello. Good. Yeah. Um, the uh, sexual intercourse between a man and a woman uh, is, you know, you give yourself totally to the other. Uh, and so um, you give yourself as you are. Uh, if you're fertile, you give your fertility. If you're not, you give what you got. If it's infertile, that's you know that's the way you are. Uh, so you can't give any more or less than your total being to another. And if you're infertile, that's what you give. If you're fertile, that's what you give. Um, taking it out, out of the context of the union of man and woman, uh, I think you can see there is there's no uh, there really is not you know based on the body. Uh, there's not a, a total self-gift that can be made. It's uh, it's not possible uh, between two people of the same sex. So, um, but I I do get that question, and you just you give what you got at the time. And that's you know some of the um, questions I get around natural family planning. You know, when you're using the infertile period, uh, isn't that somehow less than you know than if you use the fertile period? Well, that's what you are at the time. You're not fertile, so you give everything, and that's that's the main point. I think that there's a distinction to be made. Um, one kind of argument that I've heard over and over again is that the reason that the two should be equated is because there's no possibility of conception, right? So if there's no possibility of conception in the one case, and there's no possibility of conception in the other case, then what is the problem? The answer to that is in part that there's a distinction when we talk about possible. Okay, so uh, philosophers will talk about first act and second act and first potency and second potency, and I am not gonna bore you to tears with that, but what that means is more or less something like this, that you can have, there's a difference between having no potency at all and having a potential that is blocked for some reason. Okay, so say I have at the moment the potential to stand up and walk. Okay, were I to, after this panel, have a terrible accident, a trip over Anne and break both my legs, right, then my potential to walk would be blocked, I would say, right? So I can't use that potential. I can't fulfill that potential. But that doesn't mean that the potential is not part of who and what I am. If, however, there is no potential in the sense that there's no potential being blocked, there just isn't a potential at all, that's a different situation. Right, so if you make the distinction, because people will, will always say that, and they'll use, well, there's no potential, but there are two different senses of potential, and to mix them is to, it's to call apples oranges, or to equivocate, right? So it's to use one word and have two different meanings to it. 
so making that distinction, I think, is really helpful in particular to at least my students, trying to think about it rationally, what exactly does potential mean in each case? Okay, a question from the audience that hasn't been written down. Anybody want to jump to the microphone? Really? <laughs> you have to go to the microphone? You have to go to the microphone, yeah. Thank you. In terms of the question of the of the purpose of marriage, or in what is the purpose of it, I think at least from, at least from my perspective, it seems that throughout the world, the reason why people marry is because they want to have families. I mean, throughout the at least the majority of the world, people marry because they want to have children, they want to have a family, and sort of implicitly understood. And of course, society has a great interest. Um, or as someone put it, the reason why marriage is so celebrated, so celebrated throughout since time immemorial is because society needs stable families sure. where the parents are committed to each other and the children that they're going to bring forth because you can't have a, a good society or country without children who understand what it means to be a good person and it's the parents who give that to them. So uh, that's why marriage has historically always been so, so celebrated throughout all times. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll go to another um, past, more past, a couple of more pastoral questions. Um, I'll just read both of them. How will Humani Vitae be brought down to the parish level? How can we encourage more teachings or homilies about Humani Vitae, natural family planning? the contraceptive mentality in our parishes. Um, I think that's yours, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple priests here. I wish they hadn't left. Maybe we could ask them. I usually, you know, it's, it's very difficult uh, to, um, I mean, you, you can't do the church's teaching on marriage, family, and sexuality in a 10-minute homily. Uh, it's not possible. But, um, you know, you can do a little something, uh, and I've encouraged my priest to do this, on um, the theology of the body and a natural family planning, just, just touching on it, and uh, so people are aware of it. Uh, and I think uh, there was um, the Canadian bishops issued a document uh, about three weeks ago or so, short, it's only you know five pages long, but that's what it does. It, it starts with the body and talks about uh, human sexuality and the context of the theology of the body uh, and encourages natural family planning. So I sent that to all my priests. I said, you know, you guys want something uh, to you know, to celebrate the 50th anniversary, and I, I asked them all to give homilies on Humani Vitae. I said, "This is it. You know, if you read this, you know that that would be all that you have to do, uh, and it wouldn't take more than eight or ten minutes." So, um, I think just to know the for the laity to support their priests and say, "Yeah, we we are for the church's teaching," and we don't hate you because you, you preach the church's teaching. We won't holler at you when you talk about these things. I mean, those are the responses I get. You know, when I uh, was in the parish, you know, I, I teach what the church taught, and people would holler at me. I said, what are you hollering at me for? You know, <laughs> I'm just teaching what the church teaches. So to, for the priest to know that you support them and that you're for them and that you're on the side of the church and you're happy when they mention something about these subjects. Um, I was also going to say that at the practical parish level, my tendency is to start with um, the predictions that Paul VI made in Humanae Vitae. Just start there. Then read the stats. They're everywhere. How's it working out for us? Well, now they're intrigued because apparently Paul VI is a huge prophet. And so once you, you know, point out that um, a lot of bad stuff's gone down since Humana Vitae, and it's not helping a lot of people, then I think it's also worthwhile to say, do you want your marriage to have the best possible chance at succeeding, or are you planning to probably get a divorce? 
And so I think couples really do want their marriages to succeed. And then you can say, well, here's the thing. Cohabiting before marriage, you are significantly lessening your chances of your marriage succeeding. And the stats are out there. Get them. They're there. Second, the um, divorce rate for couples who use NFP is statistically minute. You want your marriage to succeed? Well, here's what the statistics show us. If you're using NFP, you're giving your marriage the best possible shot. So do you want a good marriage or do you want to kind of go and say, well, maybe, maybe not? Because I think at that practical level, now you've got their attention. So. Thank you. Go ahead. So in today's hookup culture, uh, how would you use the wisdom of uh, Humana Vitae to address a young woman going into Planned Parenthood who tells you that uh, she just wants to go out on the weekend and hook up with, uh, with a guy and she really doesn't care about uh, marriage or children? How would, you, how would you address that? It's Ellie's turn. <laughs> Do you have a question? We're at, it's just for questions. Go ahead, Ellie. Um, first, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. Um, part of the missionary program I was involved in in New York, we would go and um, pray and counsel it oh, in front of abortion clinics. So I have been there. I've witnessed. I think being a man there is critical. It also is putting yourself in a vulnerable spot with a young woman who in many ways has already made her decision. Being there is crucial and is the most important thing is to really prepare well by praying before you go. It's kind of the trenches. Um, praying for the right words to say in encountering her. And I think just asking questions, um, what is it that you're looking for? Do you, know that, do you know that you're made for love? Um, always speaking truth in a way that's beautiful and inspiring and to say, you know, if you go in and you change your mind, I'll be here and I, I can point you to other resources. Know that whatever decision you make, you are loved. Um, that's my gut instinct. I'll just add one thing to that since I do some of that myself. and That's just the fact of being there at all makes people pause. Even though they might go on, you may not have the right words, it won't actually matter in a way. Just being there is enough for people to go, you know, wait. It's like you, you're causing them a little bit of discomfort. And if, if they didn't care, why would they feel uncomfortable, right? They just breeze on by. If you can tell they're really angry at you for being there, and that's the start of something. Yeah. So if you have a question, only if you have a question, okay? Uh, um, well, the, when the question was asked about priest preaching, you know, mani vitae, yeah. my, 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 my thing is that I, I, first I would love to hear priests preaching against pornography, using each other, the lewdness, the constant, and that this is such a violation of what every human being was meant to be. Yeah. And, and that... Because I, I feel like I nev we never hear about the dishonesty, the lying, the cheating, the using, the pornography, the lewdness, you know, total sexual licentiousness, this promoted, obviously, especially with the president. Yeah. So it's sad. Um, yeah. And I think that we, we could be helped a lot by that. Yeah. You know, one thing I'll say in defense of homilies, <laughs> since I teach seminarians, in a way they're, they're instructed to teach about the gospel, about the today's scriptures. And um, I've been told more than once that the homily, it's not a, it's not a school, it's not a lecture, it's a, yeah. So there's plenty to, th to talk about there, right? So if, if you really want more of this in your parishes, then don't count on the homily, don't count on the priest to do all of it. You have enough now, you're equipped after today, really. You know you have resources, we'll send you more. We're all here. We all know how to speak about these topics. Invite us to come if you want us to, or find other resources, but, you know, talk it up. Look at how much conversation there was just in the few minutes you spent talking. Anyone can organize that. It's the job of the laity, you know, to transform the temporal order. The priests are there to serve us so that we can go out into the world and transform it. We can't ask Father to do everything. 
He can't. Yeah, and half the time people won't listen to him anyway, right? So especially women, they'll listen to women. People or women have more power now than ever on these topics, and we need to keep that in mind. Okay, um, I know I'm not on the panel, but yes, you can. Um, I just also want to speak a word of encouragement to. Yeah. Um, I have friends who live in Europe and in Australia, and they use a lot of resources that the church in America is providing because they feel like they don't have anything. So even Father Mike Schmitz, everyone asks, oh, you're from Minnesota? It's the only way in a Catholic perspective that they know where I come from. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and people are talking because, you know, he stepped out and has created this podcast. So there's a lot of, a lot of priests in the area who are doing incredible work and it's knowing what resources are there and how are you communicating if you have facebook post it um you know if being in a parish so many of us young people especially young singles would love to have older couples say hey do you want to come over to our house for a home-cooked meal you can talk about things like humani vitae and bring a you know be strategic in <laughs> the conversations you bring up um it'd be great go ahead Deb. We all know the degradation of the culture, and each one of you is in the trenches, so to speak, in your, in your different ways. Um, praise God. And I just was wondering if each of you could speak to um, something right now with young people that gives you hope. Because there is hope, I think, and, and, and there is a cultural tide that's turning, but I'd love a story or, or something that you experience that gives you hope for the culture and for our young people. Each each panelist, if you could. Maybe I'll just start. Uh, there's a, a adoration, a, or Eucharistic adoration that uh, started here at St. Thomas uh, by uh, Bishop Cousins called Coriezu. And uh, the young people uh, really flocked to that and uh, to see them praying and singing uh, and in love with our Lord, uh, that's very powerful. Um, I would say just the the number of young people that will commit a year or more to some sort of missionary group after, and it's very strong in the Twin Cities, whether it's Net Ministries or St. Paul's Outreach, Focus, um, the Culture Project is born out of a group that I was involved in, and they are on fire for the faith. And beyond that, they're talking about these very things in a way that's attractive. For me, that's really hopeful. It's not just communicating church teachings, but it's in a very joyful, vibrant, attractive manner. I guess the first thing, it's not really a story, but I'm the faculty advisor for the Students for Human Life on campus. And I will tell you just how smart and joyful our students are. And that makes a huge difference. I would also say, though, that there's nobody who starts out saying, I guess I'll settle, yeah. right? And when you're 18, at least I found in classes that where you start is just sort of the obvious or <laughs> the story, where like, okay, well, how many people are excited about being a mediocre parent? How many people want to be a mediocre mom, a mediocre dad, right? It's just, it answers itself. Of course not. Okay, well, how many people want to be a mediocre husband or wife? right, or priest, or whatever else it is. Nobody, no hands go up for that. Okay, so they've spent a ton of time preparing for which college to go to. And they spent a ton of time thinking about which major. I mean, I, I know I certainly did, right? What am I supposed to do? We spend a lot of time emphasizing what kind of planning they're doing for those four years. But I've realized over time, the question of how that fits into some sort of larger life plan we don't spend as much time with, which I think is interesting, right? So what, <laughs> if you wanna be a really good mom and a really good, to me, a really good mom and a really good wife or husband and father, what would that mean you need to do now to set up for what it's gonna look like 10 to 15 years from now, right? Because they're being asked, what are you doing with your major that's gonna set you up for your goals 10 to 15 years ago, or sorry, 10 to 15 years from now? I think the best term I've heard for this is a colleague who called it spiritual capital. And she said that she, as an undergrad, realized that she wasn't going to have as much time later in life to do certain things. So, because she's, <laughs> my friend was Deborah, uh, she 
memorize as many Irish songs as she could, so she didn't have to think up lullabies, which I thought was brilliant. Um, and then she, <laughs> I, she read as much theology as she could get her hands on, right? And she went to adoration because she figured her schedule wouldn't be hers forever. I thought, wait, that's so practical and so brilliant, and if you built those habits at the same time, you're basically forming yourself as a spiritual and intellectual adult, right? That, that's what you're doing. If we talk about all the aspects of that, students really are hungry for it because they know it's true. To say to someone, do you want to be a fully functioning, capable adult? The answer is clearly yes. So let's talk about that all at the same time. It doesn't sound like um, positive or sign for hope, but I think it kind of really is that um, my encounters with this generation is they know that this isn't working. <laughs> and Thomas Aquinas you know, says the natural law is written on our hearts. But John Paul II said in one of his encyclicals that um, it's gotten pretty dark in there. And it might be written on our hearts, but it's pretty hard to see sometimes. And the way I like to think of it is, I mean, philosophers say that negative knowledge is real knowledge. And so, like, sometimes if you've ever had the experience of you, you can't think of the word you want to use, right? It's on the tip of your tongue, but you cannot think of the word you want to use. And so, of course, those helpful people around you are proposing various candidates for the word that it is. And you're saying, no, it's not that. No, it's not that. No. Well, how the heck do you know? You can't remember the word, <laughs> right? But you know enough to spot the imposters. And so if you take that to the level of the natural law, I truly believe that this generation doesn't know the word, <laughs> but they can spot the imposters. They know that this isn't working. And so um, I think that's the biggest sign for hope that there is going to be a beginning, and, um, and we are not left to chaos. Christ did not do that. Thank you. Looks like you have a question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I have a lot of pro-choice friends who, uh, when talking about the unborn child, they will acknowledge that it's human, but they will not, they say it's human, but it's not a person, and therefore they have a right to abort. So how can I, um, I'm trying to think of how to say, how is a human being a person at the same time in the womb? If, does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Kathy, yeah. Okay, here's my two seconds. You will find folks who will, actually your friends are doing better than the other half. So somehow, half of people just say, it's just, right, we, we're dealing with just tissue, right? So we're not even at the point of saying there's a human organism, which is just a denial of facts. Okay, so if we're at the point where there's a human organism, then the, the pushback, I think, rationally comes by asking, so if all human beings have human rights, how is it that some human organisms don't, right? If a, if a human being is, is in fact a human organism and we think that all human beings have rights, you seem to be putting in new criteria. What are your new criteria, right? So I think the disabled have human rights, do you? I think that any human being at the end of life or beginning of life, regardless of how you can manifest your reason, I'm now getting wordy, I'll stop that, but, but right, what are your, if we think they're human rights, then presumably every human would have them. What other criteria are you putting on? Um, I will say two, two minor things as well. One is very minor. There's a, a set of videos that a friend sent me. She's in charge of the Pro-Life Center here at UST. It's called Choice and then the number four and then the number two. And they're cheeky. They're cheeky videos. They're pro-life videos. And they're, if you can say this about the topic of abortion, these are fun videos. And so far as the question is, uh, they're, they're kind of tongue in cheek. So in one of them that comes to mind as you say this, the woman is in the pink wig and she's talking about the magic birth canal that gives humans rights. Because how else could it be that you could have a right in one place and not a right in the other place? So it just sort of is um, maybe a, 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 a little bit more... Entertaining. In, in, in a, oh, there you go. It, it pushes the point. Um, I will say that one thing I find very interesting is when we talk about abortion in my ethics class, many of my students don't know how young preemies can be and still survive, right? And I found this with folks who come to my door as well, 
right? So I said, okay, well, Roe v. Wade talks about viability. Do you know that preemies can survive from 24, 25 weeks? And do you think the preemie in the NICU unit has rights? And if the answer is yes. I go, okay, so what would prevent the child in utero at 24, 25 weeks, or frankly, 30 weeks? from having rights. And then they're gonna have to tell you another story. It's not that the child doesn't have rights, it's that the mother's rights trump the child's rights, right? And now the conversation is not on their footing. Now it's on your footing, right? Because now we've gotten to the point where we're dealing with a child who has rights. I mean, if your friend hasn't walked away by this point. Uh, people are as excited about this conversation as maybe I get at the time of having the conversation. But. But it's a, it's a great question, Alexa, and I think it's a central one. I can tell a quick, quick story about that. We had a comp uh, panel discussion a few years ago with a philosopher, a theologian, uh, evolutionary biologist, and a lawyer, Teresa Collette. And the, and the question was, when, when does life begin? In other words, what co really constitutes a person? And the philosopher and the theologian got up and spoke eloquently from their disciplines about this, that, and the other thing, and they made beautifully elaborate arguments and so on. And then the evolutionary biologist got up and said, you know, when you guys asked me if I would do this, I was confused. I thought it was a trick question. I thought this was a kind of red herring, that you were trying to trick me into saying something publicly that I shouldn't. I don't understand how you can even ask, when does life begin? Because everyone knows that it begins at conception. And the whole audience went, oh, this is the evolutionary biologist telling us that life begins at conception and every, all the bi everybody knows it. And then Teresa got up, the, the lawyer, and said, it wasn't scripted, it wasn't planned, it was so shocking. She said, the real question is, who gets constitutional protection? That's the real question. Yeah, so that's what we're fighting for. Don't let anybody tell you that there's a question at all. Like Obama says, well, when life begins is a bit above my pay grade. Remember that a few years ago? No. My, my daughter Maddie knew when she was a baby, when she was three. Of course, she was born a genius, but <laughs> she was talking when she was six months old. She knew already all kinds of things. Well, anyway, yeah. So just that, that seems important to say, that the biologists know that life begins at conception, period. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I... Uh, I think, um, I guess I want to open the floor. We have five minutes left and we want to make some concluding remarks, a couple of announcements, that sort of thing. But we didn't do any debriefing after your discussion or after your breakout sessions. So if there's anything that anyone in the audience would want to say about an insight you had today or something important you'd want to highlight for the rest of us, now's your chance. I do Sonia. Have a Seventeen. Seventeen, thank you. <laughs> well, yep. And you can read two articles by Mary Everstadt. One of them is in this book over here. It's a newer version of one she wrote in uh, the, on the 40th anniversary of Humani Vitae, 20, uh, 2008, where she spells out all the consequences. It's called The Vindication of Humani Vitae. And the newer version is in this volume, as I said, and they're both very definitive. There's no question about it. Aunt Dr. Maloney is absolutely right. Yeah. Anything else that you'd want to say? Yes, go ahead. Run to the microphone. Um, one thing that I find really um, uh, glaring to me, and, it's it, and I mentioned this in our small group, um, is something the bishop said about not quite knowing why we are not able, why we were not able to chew on humani vitae when it was when it was given to us, and why we're still having difficulty with it now. I think that the this is just my my theorizing that the reason why is because um, around the same time we also had um, universities and academia um, become infused with relativism. And that kind of got a grapple hold of the church as well. And so now we're seeing things like transgenderism and abortion spiking and women not having babies at home. And I mean, all of these things that have 
really um, divorced us from who we are as human beings. Um, and I, I mean, I just, I just don't see any way that these two things are not linked together and why we still have difficulty with humani vitae right now and why it's important to talk about mm -hmm. humani vitae and why it's important to push back against the cultural relativism that we're experiencing in these last 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's just my, my takeaway from Thank you. Does someone on the panel want to give a one or two sentence uh, rebuttal of relativism? I have all the terrible I said arguments two today. Senses. Okay. Relativism is a theory. If all theories are equally good, my theory is just as good as relativism. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you if you Yeah, for effect. Yeah. My daughter Maddie, truly, she's able. She, we were at the at my sister's in California, and her, my niece Sof Sophie said, "Well, all truth is relative, Aunt Deborah. You know that. I mean, everybody knows that." And I went like this, and my daughter Maddie goes, "Mom, I got this." <laughs> and she said, "If if all truth if all truth is good, then um, uh, what, what was it? How do you, uh, if all truth is good, then?" Wait, if all truth is relative, then how come your truth is absolute? That's the only absolute then. And it's itself, it's it's a self-performative contradiction in philosophy. It's hoisted on its own petard. The minute you try to implement the proposal, it fails on its own terms. So so yeah, just good. <laughs> Teach your daughters and your sons that. It doesn't work. Can't work. Okay. Um, well, anything else? You were so talking so much before, I guess I thought. Okay, I'm just wanting to give you enough of an opportunity. Okay, so sh should we thank our panel then? <laughs> Did you want to say something by the way of concluding remarks? I have some announcements to make, but you go ahead, Kathy. It is 1.30, so my concluding remarks are gonna be really, really brief and primarily in the way of thank you. So one thing that has been brought to my attention is that Deborah Savage, standing to my left and your right, has been named Catholic Defender of the Year and will be honored by the Catholic Defense League of Minnesota. Thank you. She wasn't going to make that announcement. <laughs> no. So I wanted to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank all of you for reading through this document as a group, this has been fantastic. I know that I read most encyclicals by myself at my kitchen table. This is a treat. Right? I wanted to thank Bishop Lavoir for being with us and all of our speakers, and thank you for your talk. Ellie, thank you for yours. I wanted to thank Relevant Radio as our media sponsor. They've done a ton of work in trying to promote this conference. Um, are you gonna talk about October 22nd? You can, go no, ahead, no, no, you can I'm say it twice. October 22nd, there was a full-day academic conference at the University of St. Thomas. Folks like Mary Eberstadt and folks like Janet Smith will be with us. So big guns, as they say. Police come. It's going to be fantastic. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our volunteers. A lot of people here were here at 7.30 in the morning setting up signs, and I thank my own sons for doing such a good job with this. And last but certainly not least, I wanted to thank the folks who brought babies. Thank you for bringing your babies. <laughs> That's what I have to say, and I thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. It's been a beautiful and Christ-filled day. Thank you, Kathy. So I, Kathy said it all and all, said it all so well. I'll only add this one thing that uh, there's a, a handout in your packet that describes or will remind you about the October 22nd conference and lists uh, several of the speakers, including Bishop Cousins and Janet and uh, Mary Everstadt. And then um, I should also mention we're modeling it on what we did last December. I'm not sure if, if I see a lot of nodding heads. What we're trying to do throughout the day is build a case. 
Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about the status of the document, then we're going to start with lived experience and move from there to build a case for why Humane Vitae was right, why it's still right, and why unless we figure this out, the, rest, the next 50 years are going to look even worse. Okay, so I hope that you'll be able to join us. There's a day-long conference, and then there's also an evening event for those that aren't able to come during the day when some of the speakers will uh, offer shorter versions of their presentation, okay? There'll be a charge, not a big one, but mostly to um, defray the expenses of lunch and so on. So please, everybody come. It'll be great. It really will be great. And I want to offer my thanks from the Siena Symposium for your presence here and your presence at all our events. And I want to add, if you want to be on our mailing list and you're not already, I'll leave these clipboards up here and please come and add your name. Um, and I guess we'll see you in October, if not before. Thank you for coming.